Hello and welcome. I am David Lowry with Club Fantasy, and today we are interviewing Jason Katarski with Green Couch Games. We're going to talk about his new game, Fidelitas, that is on Kickstarter with only five days left, so please pay attention. Make sure you check it out right now on the right side of the screen. You should see a link to the game itself. You can click on it and go straight to it right now and have a look. Jason, welcome, and thank you for doing this short notice and uh, giving us an opportunity to find out about your game. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for having me on, David. It's really cool. All right. So we got Fidelitas, which is five days left. Give the viewers a two-minute synopsis of what this game is. Yeah, Fidelitas is the first game for my new company, Green Couch Games. And the uh, the heart of the game is that you live in a medieval uh, uh, village, a city, and you are faithful to your city. And what you want to do is you want to be the person who, who can lead the revolution against a corrupt crown. So it is your plan to use the manipulate the people in the, in the community to different locations using action cards to try to meet some hidden objectives to prove that you have what it takes to kind of lead the charge. So it's a game that takes about 20 to 30 minutes. It was designed by myself uh, and another designer named Philip DuBerry, who's responsible for games like Revolution and Canalis and Courtier. And uh, we're just really excited about how, how it's going, especially as a first-time publisher. Uh, the game is, uh, is kind of making a splash right now. Now, I'm looking at the box cover, and the guy kind of looks a little bit like you. Was that... <laughs> I, I don't know if that was intentional. We worked with a great artist. Her name's uh, Jackie Davis. She's from the UK, and she worked on some other games uh, like like Bell the Ball and Epic Resort. And my first game, uh, the great Heartland Hall and Company, was put out by Dice Hate Me, and they also did Bell the Ball. So that's where I discovered her artwork. I just love the kind of cartoony, whimsical feel. And um, and she did illustrate a picture of me in Dice Hate Me's game Brewcrafters. Mm -hmm. So she had seen me before, but I'm not sure it was intentional or not. But uh, you know, maybe that's why I liked it so much. <laughs> Well, we got we got you got a twenty or thirty minute game. You got about seventy five cards or more, and it's yep. two four people, right? That is correct. And you're fi putting it in the fill a category, um, but it's not a micro game. And from what I can see, this game has a lot to offer to it. What are you going to get out of this game that you're not going to get out of another twenty minute card game? I think maybe that's. That's it, right? Like, you're going to get a lot out of that 20-minute card game because it is something that appeals to a wide audience. Um, there's some... There's, there's engaging decisions with every card you play. So you, you start out really simple with two cards in your hand, and each card is a character that has a specific action. It can be played to a certain location that's out of these five in front of you. And it usually either manipulates what you have in your hand or it manipulates the cards on the board in front of you in order to meet these kind of objectives that are on these hidden goals. So um, each card you play... Is, is an important decision. Even though you have two two or three decisions to make, it still matters because you can help yourself, you can hurt the other players. So I think that there is a little bit of meat there um, for people who like a meteor game, but it, but it's a meteor game that plays quickly, and it's one of those games that gets better the more you play it because the more you know what those objectives are, the, the more you can kind of anticipate what other people are doing and really kind of play uh, defensively as well as offensively where you can help yourself while you're hurting others. So that's a, that's a kind of a fun thing that grows the more you play it. Awesome. All right, I just, I didn't realize it, but the, the link wasn't up there. So for those of you tuning in, the game should be showing on the on the screen now where you can see the link and go straight to it. If you're on our if you're on our Club Fantasy page, there's a thousand links to it. Just click on any picture or any title of the game, and it'll take you straight to it. Um, also, you can ask questions. So in a minute, I'm going to put up the question and answer section here on the video, or you can just tweet us at Club Fantasy if you have any questions for Jason. Um, he will be able to answer those for you. Uh, now, this is not your first game. No, it's not. So what made you decide to go from, oh, trying to find a publisher into, oh, I want to start my own company and get my life away to all this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, um, when I first, this is my first game was uh, The Great Heartland Holland Company, and when I, when I first designed that game, I have this kind of thing where I just have to do it. I have to follow through with the project. You know, I can't just let anything be an idea. If it gets a hold of me, like I have to go for it. So I was I was already toying with the idea of self-publishing initially, and then um, I took the idea to my wife, and she's like, "This is pretty cool. It's a it's a good game." And uh, and I'm like, I th "I'm thinking about publishing it," and she says. No, thank you. Why don't you go ahead and try to spend somebody else's money first? So, uh, so I'm like, oh, okay, that's fair. So I started uh, doing some email pitches to different publishers, and and ended up connecting with a small publisher that that was interested, and 
we had we had been working on it for a little while, but then they kind of hit some bumps in the road, and I didn't see my game coming out anytime soon, and I had been waiting and waiting and waiting, so so I ended up going out to look for some other publishers and met met up with Dice Hate Me at Origins Game Fair, and uh, they loved it, and and we went for it. So that was kind of my just my introduction to the whole the whole scene um, of game design, and. I learned a lot, so I just thought, "Hey, this publisher is going to help me learn a lot, and I'm going to I'm going to get out there and get a taste for it before I really can do anything else." You know, um, the, it's a big step to go from looking at publishers to doing your own company, and you don't realize how much. At least most people don't realize how much work it really takes, not only to get a company off the ground, but the more you grow, the more time it takes. So yeah, what was that adjustment like for you? Yeah, that you know, so it, it was. It came at the right time. So I, I'm a I'm a pastor as well, and I was a church planter. So I started a new church two years ago, and it just uh, we had this mass exodus at the beginning of the year, and we're down to just a handful of people. So it just it just everything made sense that it was time to to close our doors. So we we had made a good run. Um, and then I have been doing hospice chaplain work as well, kind of a part-time gig doing that as in addition to church planting. So when the church planting uh, went away, um, you know, it took some time to kind of figure out what's next. And, and just my life seemed to be more pointed, like, hey, this game thing is going good. You have a passion and excitement about it. And just the connections I was making were, were really awesome. Um, and I had this game, Fidelitas, that had been sitting with another publisher for a while. And, and we... Uh, just felt like, hey, you know what? Uh, I think I want to give this this publishing thing a try, so I can at least say I did it, you know. And so I took that game and said, we're uh, we're going to go ahead and do this ourselves. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Um, and I've always been the kind of person that's really like likes the whole process, right? So I played in bands and stuff. I played in punk bands. So I would book tours. I would write songs um, with some other guys. I would do the marketing. I'd hire the artists. I'd put the album together, book the studio time. You know, I'd do the whole thing, and I've always loved that. Like, the the, the whole process has always been really... ...played into my public thing as I... ...decided to do public because it was the most ready to go. It was small. It was with a great designer, with, with Philip DeBerry. And um, and I just thought, hey, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to try to do it right. So this is kind of an experiment in starting a new publishing company to see how much it really takes. But so far, I've loved pretty much every minute of it. I, I, I want to continue doing it. Um, it's just a matter of uh, figuring out what's next and continuing to learn along the way because there's, there's a big learning curve. But uh, it's the kind of thing that, that I want to dig into. It's the kind of thing that gets me excited. So... How did you come to be working with an already established game designer like Philip? Yeah, I actually uh, thank uh, the, the internet for that one, right? right. So I uh, I followed Philip on on Twitter, and we had just had had some similar friends, some uh, some shared acquaintances, and I had an idea for this little game and thought I would just pitch it to a few people and say, hey, what do you think about this? Could you play test it? Give me some feedback. So I just reached out to him on Twitter because he was somebody who seemed nice and who had a different style when it came to game design than, than myself. And uh, it resonated with him, and he said, hey, what do you think about co-designing this? I think it's a good idea, but we've got a ways to go. So um, so what do you think? Let's work on it together. And at first I said, well, I don't know. It's my baby I'm trying to let go of, but... But then I thought, you know, there's a lot to learn from working with somebody else. So we uh, we dove in and just kind of designed the entire game pretty much over email and then met up a few months later to uh, test it together after we had been kind of testing it independently with our own kind of game groups and families and, and did some fine-tuning and, um, you know, just kept working on it back and forth and, and kind of developed the relationship through game design. So it was a really fun opportunity. I, I just interviewed... Um the Bamboozle Brothers, I think a week, week and a half ago, about game design. And they, you know, they live on opposite ends of the country, and they do a lot of things over the internet by email or forums or whatever. How much of an ex different of an experience is it to try to design a game that way versus sitting across the table from somebody? What are you missing out on when you're not face to face? Well, uh, I get. I think both ways have their their pros and cons. So, uh, the, working with Philip was my first experience, but since then, uh, I I've started working with uh, another good designer named Andy Lennox, who I do a, a, a podcast with him called the Twenty Minutes of Filler. But so, and he lives in my local area, so we actually do the face to face across the table thing. 
um, which is really great because the ideas just flow when, when I'm working face to face, and we just bounce ideas back and forth, and we can kind of you know say yes or no very quickly. We can change stuff on the fly, and it takes no time to try something new. Um, and it's a really good um, brainstorming uh, space to work with somebody. Now, working with Philip over mostly email is, is different because it's we, we've had to really streamline this process. We've had to really like laser focus. We would we would come up with an idea. And then we'd really want to make sure we could articulate that because we had to communicate it over email first. So um, so it helped us really communicate clearly. It helped us really think things through before we just went with it. Um, so I'm not really sure what I'm missing except for maybe, like, the fun of sitting in the presence of, like, another human being. Because right. uh, it, it, it really helped me be a better designer, helped me communicate better. Um, and, and working with Andy's great, too, in its own way, but we can get distracted a lot because there's other things we can do too, like record a podcast or play some other games. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's all work when you're doing it over email. So <laughs> Now, the, the game itself is fully funded. You asked for 12 Right now you're sitting at a little over $28,000, five days to go. But there's some stretch goals still to be unlocked. So why don't you tell the listeners what's left to, what, what the less, I'm sorry, what the last stretch goals are that they could be a part of. Yeah, so uh, this this might be a little bit of a scoop for anybody who tunes in, but we have uh, so right now we're about a thousand dollars away from the party pack promos, which is going to add five cards to the game. There's a couple goofy photo cards of of me and Andy Lennox uh, uh, on one of them, and then Philip the, on the other, as well as uh, kind of the horror movie version of one of the regular characters in the game, the Bloody Butcher. And then we had our artists kind of go back in and make. Uh, Cards that to, that that fit the art style based on the the herald and the chiseler, which were the the silly cards because that's what backers were telling us they wanted. So we added that, and we're about a thousand dollars from hitting that goal. And uh, and then after that, we have a couple new mission cards that are going to be coming out, which uh, another you know few thousand dollars away. And then there's going to be something coming that that I uh, I'm not sure it'll be a stretch goal as much as it will be a thank you. But uh, it's a print and play version of a game that uh, that I originally designed that Fidelitas is based on, a kind of a kids' family game. So I don't want to say too much about that, except for it's fun and it's going to be a free print and play, another game. But uh, it's coming. So awesome! Now I got to say, you know, looking through the Kickstarter, it's um, it's a simple game, but by looking at the page itself. You wouldn't re you wouldn't realize that. I mean, it looks like there's a lot more to it than there really is. Um, I know based on watching the Rado's run through of the game that it is a deep game for what it is. Um, where do you think it best fits? What type of gamers? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, I've played it with with a wide range of people from the the, the more intense, you know, gamers and game designers, um, and then the the people who who play games at family gatherings, maybe, if there's nothing else to do, you know, so kind of this wide range, and um, it works pretty well with with all the groups. It's definitely like a filler if you're looking at the hardcore gamer, something you're going to play when you have just a couple other people or you're waiting for other people to show up that you want to have a meaningful experience that's quick, um, or it's something you can you can kind of teach people as a way to kind of maybe wet the whistle for the, for the gaming hobby, kind of a gateway game, so... Um, because it's easy enough to teach. I can say you play a card, you do what the card says, and then you find out if you, you know, completed one of your, your secret missions. And and then whoever gets a certain amount of points wins. So it's simple enough that you learn the game as you go. You learn the actions the first game. You learn the goals the, the first game. Um, so I, I think that it's easier for people who played some games to really pick up and get into quicker. But... I mean, we're talking a 20-minute game, so by the end of the first game, you're ready to play the second one without referencing the rules, without needing, you know, to ask a bunch of questions. It just starts to sing after a few turns. So, it's uh, it's the kind of game I think is good for introducing new people or kind of filling the gap in between the bigger games uh, with the, with the more serious gamers. Now you've got some pretty good uh, quotes here from people saying things like, "I'm a hot mess," but the game itself is very cool. It's so fast, <laughs> fluid, and fun. Um, to get a game that, that doesn't have a bunch of quirks to it or, or things are maybe unbalanced might be a bit difficult, especially if it's only your first or second game being designed. What were some of the steps you took to make sure that you had a very well-balanced game? Yeah, you know, that 
it really comes down to playtesting. Um, just playtesting it over and over again um, as designers uh, in our own groups and paying attention to, uh, you know, like stuff that was running away if it was too powerful or stuff that was getting, you know, underutilized because it wasn't powerful enough. And then we take it to uh, the next stage of playing with people we don't know, you know, showing up at conventions and asking people to do demos, sending out some uh, print and play copies to different different folks that like to play test games and getting feedback from, from different game groups that kind of give us their feel for it. And then it's just about uh, really fine-tuning. You know, you just, you just have, to, have to mess with it until it all, all feels right. So, I mean, Philip and I have each played this game, you know, at least, I'd guess, 100 times. Uh, on our own, and, and plus we've been demoing it, and we sent out 40 review copies to different reviewers, and uh, and lots of them have, uh, like, you know, most of them have posted written reviews or video reviews and have, have been kind enough to share some of their feedback if you know, some stuff felt off, and either, you know, we, we know the game well enough that we know their concerns and, and have a good reason for it, or, you know, we seriously look at it and continue the fine-tuning process. So we're, we're getting very close to locked in, um, and it's just, it's just, you gotta play it, and you gotta play it, and you gotta play it. We're not mathematicians or anything, so we, we play it more by, by, uh, by feel. But uh, I think you can, you can get a good feel of balancing a game just by, by playing it, and playing it, and playing it, and and really paying close attention, trying different strategies, and seeing where you end up. Now you can get onto this game for nineteen dollars, so it is not expensive, I and mean, that's that's for the U.S. Um, you, you can do a, a minimum bit of five. So if somebody just wants to back, they can get in at five dollars just to support. Um, for nineteen dollars, how can you go wrong with a twenty-minute game that you can pull out <laughs> over and over again? Right? I mean, I, I'm assuming based on the look of it that the feedback has been there is a lot of gameplay here and there is a lot of replayability factor to this game. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. You imagine. So at nineteen dollars, you can't go wrong with that. So if you're watching, folks. Definitely take a look. Also, don't forget, you can ask questions. So if anybody's viewing and they want to ask questions, make sure you do so or tweet us at Club Fantasy, and we will get those questions to Jason to have them answered for you. Um, Theme-wise, where did the theme come from? Yeah, the theme, uh, it really came in a dream. <laughs> I, I had designed a kid's game that was based on a kid's TV show called Yo Gabba Gabba that had uh, kind of the core mechanic in, of, of the game in it. And uh, I was having fun playing it with my daughter, but then I thought, you know, it'd be cool if I could figure out how to add some more meat to this game and make it a, a filler game, an adult game. Uh, so, so I was just the idea of medieval uh, village popped into my head one night as I was kind of nodding off to sleep, and I just saw the game, you know, a very early version of the game in my head. Um, and I like, I got into games because of stuff like Settlers of Catan, the lighter family Euros, and a lot of the times uh, those Euro games can have this kind of this dry artwork, this kind of bland, like, theme, like, medieval, you know, uh, Europe uh, trading goods, you know, like, so, and, and gamers take their games very seriously, so I thought I would kind of take that medieval theme and add some really silly light art to it, you know, Jackie Davis's artwork looks like, you know, it could be in classic Disney movies, and, uh, and then take this kind of light, chaotic, silly, kind of fun game, um, to kind of poke a little bit of fun at the seriousness of the of the Euro game genre, you know, like, hey, it's, it's we're medieval and and um, there's hidden agendas, but it's going to be fun and we're going to make sure it looks fun. To kind of just poke a little fun at the the, the dryness that's out there in in some of those kind of heavier games. Um, so yeah, just it felt like a, a nice easy place to settle, like the the medieval game. Well, what would be happen? You know, people are you know, oppressed and they want to revolt because they love their community and want to see it thrive. So they so they work together or, or show people that they have a plan and try to convince others that they can make stuff happen. It just, um, it feels specific enough for a fun game, but generic enough to, uh, to play around with and have a lot of fun with. Now, straddling the fence, because you are a gamer, and most publishers are, well, most yeah. designers. What is the greatest feedback now that you find you can get as a designer about your game? Is it the praise? Is it the, is it the criticalness from somebody who's actually being serious and not just being a jerk online saying, hey, look, <laughs> but here, you know, think about this. What do you find the most useful and, and what keeps you pumped to keep, to keep going through this kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think it depends on what time it is in the process, right? If it's early on in the process... Um, I need 
I need to know that people think it's fun. You know, like I need to know that there's something good there, something that is enjoyable, um, something that is worth pursuing. So that's what I look for first. Is like, okay, uh, I know this isn't finished. It's really sloppy. It's really messy. It's not done. It's got a, little, a lot of work. But what do you think about this idea? You know, like the the, the basic mechanics, the basic theme, um, and and that's a really good way to kind of like figure out if I should spend a whole lot of more time on it, you know. Uh, and there's games that I show to people, and they, they don't connect as, as quickly, so I don't end up spending as much time on those. You know, I maybe shelve them for a while until inspiration strikes, but maybe later on in the process, I, I need just straight-up honesty. You know, I don't need... I don't need my friends saying, oh, it's so cool you make games, you know, like, this is really fun, it's really cute, you know, I'm like, no, I'm like, get in there and tell me what the problems are, tell me what you love about it, tell me what doesn't work for you, um, so then I can focus on making the game as good as it can be, you know, it's it's easy to come up with an idea, but to, like, take that idea and bring it home it is a totally different ball game. so, um, yeah, that's that that that's that's a there's a wide range and anything in between. It's always good to get that. Hey, this is really cool, and here's where it could be better. You know, at the end, or it's really cool to be like, hey, this is uh, this needs a lot of work. You know, from early on. But I think those are the two key spots for me. It's like I need to know it's good and worth going for, and then I need to know how to make it the best game possible. One of the things I always wonder about because I don't design games is getting the play testers. And you you said yourself you've played it over a hundred times. It is critical, obviously, to have as many plays of this game out there as, as possible before you decide to launch. How did you go about finding play testers who were actually going to play the game and get back to you with feedback? Yeah, you know, um, I, I usually start with my family, so I start with my wife, and then maybe, you know, have some friends over, and, and we usually play published games, but occasionally they'll, they'll humor me with letting me play something of, of my own uh, and, and kind of get that initial feedback. And once I feel like it's okay, I work on it, and then I got to get it out there to more people. So uh, there's a couple of different resources that I really uh, like to use for that, and one of them, and use isn't the right word, but um, my my game designer friends are awesome. You know, like what what is really cool is to build relationships with other people who make games because they they start to have an eye for it. They look at their games through different lenses. They know what to look for, um, and then we have this mutual thing where where I can. Uh, I can play their games and give them feedback. They can play my games and give give me feedback. So that's a really great way. Um, and luckily, you know, there's some there's some good folks that I meet up with with at conventions that help with that. Um, but then there's also uh, some different events that are really cool. Like uh, Unpub is uh, unpu- unpub.net. It's uh, run by Daryl Lauder, and uh, they have a Unpub festival, which is unpublished games um, every uh, every year as well as these kind of little unpub minis that are just at local game stores around the country. And a bunch of game designers get together and, you know, stake their claim of a table and set their prototypes on it. They invite people in from the community to come and test games for feedback. Publishers show up. And, and you know, it's such a friendly industry. Publishers who aren't going to publish your game are going to be honest about your game. They're going to maybe give you feedback about your game, how you can make it better. Other game designers are very generous. But, like, getting to that place, you know, just going. Um, this year, Unpub is going to be in Maryland in February. So I have a table reserved, and I'm going to be there testing my new games, whatever those are. And and just being around other creative people who are love games has been a huge resource for, for building that. Uh, Protospiel is another one. That was started... Um, well, not started, but the main one was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that's an hour from where I live. I'm in Flint, Michigan. Okay. So, uh, and that's a little more um, just designer-centric, where it's designers playing designer games, a little smaller scale than Unpub, but, you know, a great place to go for feedback. So um, you got to just dig in and find out, you know, where people like to play games and get there, you know, even if that means going to, you know, a convention every once in a while, you know. No, God you, forbid we have fun at a convention. <laughs> you mentioned Daryl Lauder. He he did something on this game, correct? Yeah, yeah. He's a graphic designer, so he did all the layout. Um, Jackie Davis did the illustration. She did the characters, and she did the icons for mm-hmm. like the shield logos. Um, but uh, Daryl did everything else. He put it all together. So he chose the fonts. He he built the cards. Yeah, he's 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 awesome. He's also a game designer. He has uh, right now he has a game on. Kickstarter, it's the expansion for his hit game, Compounded, from Dice Hate Me Games, a game about chemistry. So, yeah, he's a great designer, great graphic designer, all-around good guy who's contributing to the hobby big time with his uh, with his Unput program that he's kind of inherited from John Moeller. All right, so, so if you're out there and you're looking to design a game and you need a, design, a graphic designer to look up Daryl Lauder, uh, he's pretty easy to find out. 
on Twitter. So um, that's my... get louder. Get louder is his Twitter. Twitter. There you go. All right. Um, now oh, I just totally lost my question. I hate it when I do that. Um, oh, what was your biggest surprise once you once you decided to do this and launch this on your own without having a publisher? What's been the biggest surprise for you in the process? Um. Well, I mean, the first three days, uh, the game, I, I think, it funded in three and a half days. So uh, we had a, a really great start. And, and, you know, I knew it was good. I knew the art looked great. I knew we were getting good reviews. Uh, I knew that people knew who Philip were. I knew people were starting to know who I am because of Heartland hauling. And um, I had an idea that we'd be okay. But I've been blown away just how much people have taken to it. You know, like we, we're up to almost 1,400 backers around the world that, that want this game, um, and that is that is surprising. It's exciting. You know, you don't you don't see those numbers on every Kickstarter campaign, no. um, but it's it's a great thing how 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 many people have really taken to this little game. Yeah. Just I would imagine the flood of comments and. Everything can be a little bit overwhelming, and really just kind of like, wow, you get that, you get that euphoria those first few days because everybody's so excited about it, and you're already off thinking about the next game, aren't you? <laughs> well, you know, if I had time to be thinking about the next game, you know, between work and and replying to comments and making sure that things are, are headed in the right direction with the, the manufacturing and all that, um, yeah, I, I mean, I steal a few minutes a day to dream about what's next, but you know. Uh, that's still very much in the works. So, so now look, give give the 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 up and coming designers the 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 real deal pitch about what it's like to do your first campaign and how much work it is to line up. All right, here's the idea. Now we need this, and now we need this, and now we need this, and and how much of your time you spend behind a computer and on the phone versus playing games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's wow, that's good. Well, so first of all, like it has to start like months and months before you even think about hitting the launch button, right? Because you, you have to build a platform. You have to have relationships with people. You can't just come out of nowhere without anybody who knows you and can vouch for you and say, hey, I've got an idea. You should throw some money at it, you know? Like, you have to you have to really work to make connections and, and share the story of what you want to do and, and learn all you can from people who've done it before. There's there's not a, uh, a scarcity of resources for learning about Kickstarter and for publishing, you know? Um, there's some really great you know resources out there to learn so you got to do a lot of learning and that's going to take time you know I, I I say this Kickstarter has really been in uh, in the works for two years and that was two years ago was when my first game came out and this game wasn't even on the radar yet um, it wasn't even invented yet but it, it started way back then and then it, you know once you you get into it um, you know you have to make time for for uh, for communicating and lining up the right people the artists the uh, the, the graphic design, the, the, the kind of just planning out, get, getting quotes from different manufacturers, that, that took you know, easily, uh, you know, I could have spent, you know, four or five hours a day, you know, five days a week working on that stuff until everything got into place. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you launch the Kickstarter once you've got all the information, you got stuff built, you got to build your, your prototype copies and send those out early enough in advance that people actually will have time to play them before your Kickstarter launches and, you know, throw up a video Please. or write a review. Let me stop you right there before you finish your thought. <laughs> yeah. This is one of the things that really gets me as a reviewer is somebody emails me and says, hey, our Kickstarter launches in five days. Can you do a review? <laughs> How soon do you think you should mail those copies out before launching your Kickstarter? Yeah, I uh, I would like to do. Let me see. Two to three months. Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> because the, re the reality is, is we've already got. I mean, look look at the games behind me. Yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of these still have to be reviewed, right? They're in the queue to be reviewed. So when people come to us, it's like, yeah, can you do that? And we're like. There's just there's not enough time in the day to get through all those games and, and arrange the play time to to get those things properly played to review them properly. Now I, I could I guess I could do up a, a fake review and say you know I played it by myself seven times and here's what it played. You don't have any idea what it really plays like because you're not playing with other people. Right. So um, you know that that's an important point. But anyways, back onto your other thought. 
if you would. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so you get stuff out to reviewers. You, uh, you know, you start figuring out, okay, how am I going to market this? You know, writing up a press release and connecting with bloggers. Um, all that stuff takes time, and, and I, I can write, but it doesn't happen very, you know, like quickly for me. It's not just something I do. You know, I have to think about it. Uh, so that takes a good amount of time. And then, you know, then I, on a daily basis, I'm, I, it's it's hard for me not to check out the Kickstarter page in between everything that I'm doing, you know, like, <laughs> um, you know, like eight, ten times a day. Uh, and then even more so earlier on or when, when something big happens, you know, you have to pay close attention that first day. You got to stick around, uh, you know, after every new update you, you write so you can respond to comments and questions. Um, you know, you can easily be doing this, uh, doing this full time if you let yourself. You know, and it's hard at night when, uh, when kind of I the work day is done, and I have to create some boundaries and say, okay, I'm going to spend some time with my family now, and you know, put away my phone, put away the laptop, and maybe check in one more time before I go to bed or whatever. But but can I keep yourself a healthy person while you're running a business? You know, this is is not all that I am, but I want to be uh, kind of faithful to those people who are pledging their hard hard earned money. You know, so you just got to be responsive and. It takes it takes some time. It's not just hey, I've got an idea, throw some money at. It. I mean, it's it's full on running a business, you know, with lots of different components. And, and you know, I've blogged about this a lot on my music blog because we deal with, with family a lot when it comes to touring musicians. You know, the family has to be completely understanding what's going on. At the same time, that doesn't mean that they give up their family for a project. So. You know, you really do have to set those boundaries, and it's also probably really helpful to have somebody who can help you run the Kickstarter, especially those first couple of days, because you're not. If you live in the U.S., you're not just dealing with people back in the U.S. You've got a whole contingent of people all across the world backing 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. who are making comments and leaving things. So, I mean, it probably behooves somebody to to maybe have a little help if they can find it, or maybe the other designer, if there's another designer, or somebody else that can maybe monitor things and, and give everybody a little bit of break because you're right, you, you know, at least the first few days on that Kickstarter, if, you, if your game is really taken off, you could spend your whole day there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? So make sure, designers, that, you know, you, you and your family have a good understanding of what <laughs> those your first few days so nobody's upset with you being so busy. Um, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a big, big deal, and we certainly don't want to see anybody having any relationship issues over a board game. So um, what else? I mean, what else can you tell us about that process? I mean, you know, what was, uh, what's the hardest part of the process for you personally? Yeah, the hardest part of the process? Um, you know, it's, it's hard when you disappoint somebody. You know, that when, when, you're, when you're working with a lot of different people who want to play your game, um, you're not going to make everybody happy. Uh, you have to, have to make decisions that maybe aren't, going to please everybody, but but you have to keep in mind um, how am I serving the game and serving the project? You know, is this decision going to, um, you know, people have great ideas and they want to contribute and I, and I love that, and, and some of the stuff sticks, you know, but but you have to really weigh that stuff because you, you can't just throw every idea in. It's going to cost you money and make you lose money on the project if you do it all. It's going to um, let your, your campaign just kind of, I don't know, just go spiral out of control, right? Where Whereas I have a, a timeline in mind, a, a time that I have promised to deliver these games, and I want to stick to that, and I want to maybe try to beat that promise, you know? Like, um, so the more stuff you add, the more suggestions you, you take, um, the more development you have to do after your Kickstarter is already running, the longer it's going to take to put those pieces together and still get it off to the printers in time to reach that promised date. So um, saying no is hard, but, but it's important, and... And you have to do that in a way where you show people that, hey, I value your input, and I'm so glad, like, I really am glad for every comment, whether it's negative or, or positive, because, man, like, they're engaged in my project, you know? Like, they care about this, you know? So um, so I think that is a really, uh, a really, it's a tough thing, but it's also this kind of like, hey, man, like, if nobody cared, nobody would be suggesting anything. <laughs> so I think that's, that's one of the hardest things is just kind of... Um, Letting people down, but I don't. I don't think that's the majority either. You know, like the, the people keep coming to the project and are interested in the game, but it's just it's just a hard thing to kind of know um, when to say when and to stick to your guns on stuff. You know. Now uh, we do have a question on Twitter, but I want to ask you this before we do. Okay. 
once the game comes out, there's always people who can't afford the game or they've already spent their Kickstarter budget. I mean, you guys are in competition with so many other games all at the same time vying for, for these people's dollars to help you fund your project. What are you setting in place so that uh, once the Kickstarter's ended, the people that didn't get in on that can pick up the game? Yeah, I'm, I'm working um, on a distribution deal, so um, the game should be available in, in game stores, hobby stores, uh, worldwide. So, um, and, and the retail price is going to be a little bit more than what the Kickstarter base pledge is. It's going to be a $20 game, and it won't come with all the stretch goals, but some of those stretch goals will be later, available later at conventions and um, those, those sorts of things. But they're, they're kind of the bonus that says... Hey, thanks for backing early and being our early adopters. You get a discount on the game. You pay for shipping, um, but you get the game a little bit cheaper, and then you're getting some bonus stuff. So, yeah, it, it should be making its way um, into the retail market after uh, after the Kickstarter backers get their copies. So, so for the people who are looking to back this, what is your projected date for mailing out the final copies to the backers? Yeah, I, I'm hoping to be able to send everything out by January of 2015. Yep, so, so I have uh, August 31st, we'll close, we'll get all the files wrapped up, and uh, hopefully uh, before the end of August we'll get everything sent off to the printer, and uh, they'll do what they do, and then it'll take the, the slow boat from China to, to get here, but then uh, we'll, we'll get them sent out as quickly as we can after that. All right, Jeremiah Lee on Twitter asks... Is Green Couch Games going to focus on small games slash filler games like your podcast, or will you branch out? That's a good question, Jeremiah Lee. Uh, my uh, yeah, my plan is the Green Couch Games will be a company that uh, focuses on filler games. So my tagline is uh, "Great little games that make great big connections," and I, I just I love games in that space. My my podcast, like like Jeremiah mentioned, is that we, we cover these short little games in short bursts of twenty minutes, um, and if it can play in less than an hour and is easy to teach and has a wide audience, then you know that's the kind of game we cover. And that's the kind of game I want to put out. I, I'd like Green Couch to be the kind of company that uh, people look to when they say, "Hey, you know, I just." I need a good filler in my collection, so that's that's my goal. Um, I don't know how far we'll push that, you know, because not all games that are good and that are easy to teach always like you know stay under an hour. But uh, I'd like to stay light on components and uh, that easy learning curve, you know, and that easy easy to get into kind of game space. Now, I gotta say, uh, I didn't at first. It didn't really hit me until a little bit later when I was looking at your stuff again. Because for the people listening, we just set this up kind of like yesterday or the day before yesterday. <laughs> but I didn't really have that much time to, to look at everything. Where did the name for the company come from? And that logo was really, really darn cool. <laughs> well, what thanks. Um, the, the logo was done by Adam McIver, who does uh, the creative department. He's a game designer. He designed Coin Age for Tasty Minstrel Games and did art for Crash Games uh, Council of Verona. So he's in deep in the design community. He's a really great guy from Chicago. So he did the logo for me. But the idea, uh, the company name, Green Couch Games, it came from um, this this old green couch that I have in my basement that we bought at a garage sale. Uh, my wife and I just twenty dollar couch. And I'm like, I think we need that couch. It's in good shape. It's it's seventies retro, and we need some place to sit in our basement. And uh, so early on, like I I it was I went back to school. I had left my job and went back to school full time, and kind of did this thing where um, every day I decided to write a new song that was based. Uh, on the Psalms, like in, in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I would just read a Psalm, and I would write a song, and I would record it on the spot, very kind of quick and, and kind of impulsive. And um, so I and I wrote all the songs on my green couch. So then I started putting out these little videos, the green couch. And then I, I had some house concerts and had some people come over, and they, they sat on the green couch and, and did some house concerts. And then I just hung out with people in that basement sitting on that green couch. So that, that green couch came to represent um, creativity and, and community to me. And it was this kind of old used thing that in itself was just, you know, a couch. But it, right. it, it meant a lot more. So the idea was I want my games to be the same thing. I want them to be fun games. I want them to serve their purpose. But I want it to be about more than that, about making meaningful connections with people, about giving people experiences they'll remember and stories they can tell their friends and really just connecting people. So, um, yeah, that green couch has been kind of a symbol in my life, and uh, it just made sense that, that it would be green couch games. That's awesome. I like it. 
Oh, thanks, man. I, I, I often, often wonder about where these names come from and what people are doing and, <laughs> you know, whatever, but there's always a story. You know, you got to hear the story. That's that's what makes things interesting. So, all right. So, again, folks, if you're watching, five days left to go. Uh, get on it. There's a, they're just less than $1,000 away from uh, unlocking another level there. Uh, and then there's one more after that, I, I believe, correct? That's correct. Um, and you can, you know, get in on this quickly. Uh, it's a great looking game. It's sharp. The artwork is amazing. Um, and based on what I can see, I haven't played it, so I, I can't be honest, but based on what I saw with Rado's run through, it looks like there's a lot of depth here. So you definitely want to at least take a look at this if you, if not back it. Um, uh, and keep your eyes out for it when it hits retail stores if you can't back it. Um, now let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that you got going on. Sure. So, Tell me, you know, what's, I know you're early in the process, but what's next for Green Couch Games? Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm looking at a few different games. I have a couple games that that I've designed that I'm considering, but I don't want to just specifically be a vanity publisher that only puts out my own stuff. Uh, I, I want something to work on when my creativity dries up. I want to help somebody else, you know, get their games out there too. So uh, I've been looking at a few games, but nothing has been signed or, or um, really, like, committed to at this point, but, um, you know, I'll be looking for card games and games with, you know, low components, but but first I want to really get to um, one game that is that is produced and delivered before I get too heavily into the next one, because this is my first time, so I don't want to bite off more than I can chew right off the bat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it simple for now. Um, other than that, I have... Uh, and my, as a designer, I have uh, uh, the reprint of Great Heartland Hall and Company is going to be hitting stores in the next couple months. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. We sold out really quick a year ago as soon as that hit stores, and uh, that's coming back. Um, I have a game that's going to be hitting Kickstarter that I designed uh, called Dead Drop with Crash Games. So Patrick Nichols putting that one out, and um, Adam uh, McIver's the uh, creative director on that one, so there's going to be some cool art stuff happening there. And that's going to be... Uh, I think mid-September, somewhere around there, is when we're planning to, to get going on that one. Um, as well as just a few other little games in the works here and there. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be at Unpub uh, 5 in, in February, so I'll hopefully be checking out some games then. I'm going to be at Grand Con in Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, in, a, in a few weeks, uh, which uh, that will have an Unpub area, so hopefully there'll be some people playing some prototypes, and I'll get some new ideas tested, and and kind of connect with a little bit of the Michigan design community there. So that's a really cool new up-and-coming convention. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, I know we'd love to... We stopped in, in Tennessee for longer than 12 hours, so that, that could be cool. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you this real quick, because one of the things that always fascinates me is artwork. I'm, I'm, I love theme, and artwork plays such a big theme. And, and coming from my entertainment background, you know, image is everything. So yeah. when I look at artists... Um, you know, it can be daunting to find an artist because there's so many brilliant artists out there with so much stuff. What are some of the things that you look for in your artists, and what? How did you go about picking them? Yeah, you know, um, there's some great forums on uh, on Board Game Geek when you look in the art and design uh, section, where where there's people that are you know offering their services and show their portfolios. Um, a lot of it's word of mouth, you know, publisher friends, you, you look and see who, who they've worked with and, like, just look at those games that you love the look of and see, you know, if that person has a website and, and if, you know, like, if they can work with you. Um, I think it is really important for a game. You, you want to have something that catches people's eye. You want to have something that says something about what the game is like. Um, and I, I think it's really important for me. I just want to pay attention to, to detail. You know, I want my games to look great. Uh, so... I want my games to play great as well. So, so if you have a great game uh, that plays great and doesn't look so good, it's going to be a lot harder to convince people that it's worth their time, you know. So, but if you get those things, you know, the synergy going there and it looks good and it plays good, then I think it's going to go a lot further. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think that it's just a lot of uh, – that's one of the fun parts, right, like is tooling around on the Internet, like looking for cool art. Like, and then just contacting people and see what happens. You know, it's all about relationships, you know. Like, Jackie Davis was amazing to work with. I'd work again with her in a minute. Um, and she she does some really great, versatile stuff. But she's getting, people are noticing her, so she's going to be busy. So schedules play into that. Can they meet deadlines? Um, you just got to figure out what you like and what you want to say with your game, with your project, with your company. 
and find somebody who fits. What what can or what should you expect from an artist as far as deadlines go? I mean, if, you know, you put out an eighty-five card game. What was what was kind of that timeline that you gave Jack or that you guys worked out to, to to have the art done and submitted by? Yeah. Um, well, we started talking earlier in the year, um, and I just kind of said I'd like to have um, good-looking prototypes by Origins, which was at the end of May uh, or early June, and. Uh, she said, I have this month and this month available, so I can knock it out that month, you know. Um, so, so what that, I mean, that, that, that's just how it has to start. Like, I had to have a timeline in mind, and then I had to see if she could, thought she could do that. So what my, my expectation is, like, if I ask an artist, you know what they can do, they, uh, you know, they, they have to know themselves and hopefully meet their deadlines. And because um, I'm a nice guy, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to have to be a jerk. But uh, you know, it wasn't like that at all with Jackie. She was a pro, man, and uh, and it's just just a matter of hey, here's the schedule. We want to launch in August. I want to get it at a couple conventions. I want to have them looking nice. So in order for my graphic designer to to have time to put things together, I need to have the art by this date. Is that doable? You know, and if if it's not, maybe maybe I look for another artist, or uh, maybe I have to adjust my timeline depending on how much I think that art is specifically important to the game. So awesome. Now. Uh... We we'll get some uh, and a couple of fun questions here in a minute, but with the influx of games coming out, I mean there are so many games coming out per year now, and you know some some places are putting out four or five Kickstarters a year. Um, where do you think the games that come out that don't have the artwork and the great components fall? I mean, do, are, are they going to last, or are they going to get the attention that they need to actually fully fund? Because there's still some games out there that come out and you're like, really? In today's day and age, with <laughs> competition out there and, you know, and some of it comes from major publishers. You know, it, it isn't always a smaller publisher. Sometimes there's a game that comes out and you're like, wow, that was pretty cheaply done. Where do you think that kind of stuff falls? And would you ever go that route just to save money on a game? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in the business. Uh, yet, <laughs> yet, or maybe I won't ever be. Uh, hopefully, be a learner for my whole life. But um, I, I don't know. For me, like gamers can can spot the same thing with publishers, right? Like games, gamers can spot a good game, right? Even if it doesn't look great, you know. Uh, but I think that that at some point, if it doesn't look good, you, you're gonna hit a wall, right? You're gonna sell your you know to the hobby market. And that'll be it, you know. And and those people will love it, and that's great. But uh, if you want to reach a, a wider audience, then um, I mean, I think that the way it looks is gonna is gonna sell a lot more copies and attract some people that maybe wouldn't be have been interested before. So um, so I don't know. Like I, I think that. Uh, I mean, I know it's different if you're putting your own money behind it versus a Kickstarter. But it would just seem to me that now everybody's kind of gotten to the point where, like, all right, the, the competition ramps up pretty sure. steadily, you know, every quarter. There's so many new designers and so many new publishers, and and so your game has got to cut through all that white noise. I mean, all those other Kickstarters going on and everybody else tweeting about it and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it always just kind of makes me go, it's like, well, you know, that game that came out a year and a half ago that had kind of mediocre opponents, would it fly today? Hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah it's, it does seem that the, the gaming industry is uh, moving forward at just a rapid pace where, like, what you can do is getting uh, with components and what you can do with themes and with art and, and production is just, like, getting better and better every year, you know? And, and that's that does leave some, some people behind, but um, I don't know. Like, people still also, like... Othello, you know what I mean. Uh, aesthetic is is important to some people more than it is others, um, but I mean, I guess Othello has an aesthetic too. It's just a very simple look that that is attractive and elegant. So, um, yeah, I mean, it seems it seems silly to not uh, spend the time and and the money, but it's scary when you get ready to hit launch, like on a Kickstarter. It's it's tough to to 
to say, well, you know, I can fund if I have this much money, but if I got this art, it's going to add this many thousand dollars, you know, to that funding goal. Or do I just pay it and not recoup it and take that chance? So, like, there's lots of questions, and you can psych yourself out pretty bad on that. So, Right. Yeah, most definitely. All right, so I'm going to ask you a couple more fun questions here. Um, what about um, if you had to pick a game, at, now that you're designing games, if you had to pick one of your favorite games that you would redesign, what would it be and why? Oh, well, that I would redesign, like make it and make it a new game to pl like play wise. Maybe there's something about it that it's like this would be so much better if we just did this, or oh. you know something. It could be a tiny fix, or it could be something like, well, if this game was rethemed this, or you know, it could be anything. That's really tough. Um... Because it's my favorite game. Because it's my favorite game, right? right? So it's pretty good. That's that's a good question. Um, there's always one thing you're like, oh, this, you know, there's a house rule because of this, or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh goodness. That's that's a really hard question. So what, what, what's coming to mind is one of my favorite games is is uh, Six Nymphed by uh, Wolfgang Kramer. So it's a really quick card game. It's it's called Slide Five, and now it's the Walking Dead card game too. Um, so here's what I would change about that is <laughs> the Cryptozoic Walking Dead version is super ugly. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it just has photograph art, like screenshot stuff from the show, which I don't know. Like that's that's fine, I guess. But I don't know. It seems like it could have been more more fun uh, if they could have. I don't know. Like the game is just such a light, fun, fun game. I can't imagine uh, how... How to make that game a whole lot better? There it is. There it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is a that is a great game, but but and, and it just they they pasted like the the original theme was n no theme at all. It has mooses on it or, or bulls, and it's silly and it's it it's a great fun game. Um, the Walking Dead version just feels like okay, I get it. The Walking Dead is cool, which I do think it's cool, but um, maybe get somebody to do drawings or something of the. Of the characters, yeah, yeah. Like that's a lot of the cards. Like they use one or two different zombies, right? Yeah, there's five. There's five different zombies in the game, and there's a couple character cards that have absolutely nothing to do with the characters in the show, other than the pictures on the card. So to me, this is one of those. And I think I wrote something about. This. I might have wrote a blog about this a while back. I don't remember, but this is like one of those things where people just get the license to sell a game, but the license has nothing to do with the game. It was it was a waste of a great license. Not even sure that it was worth the cost of the license because the game, you know, uh, taking a license and doing that, even though it's a great game normally, people are going to expect a lot more from it. They're going to expect that theme to match up to the game, and it doesn't. So it can, yeah. be, it can be more detrimental than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want people, like, I want people to play Six Nymphed. I want people to play that game because I love it, and I think it's a blast. And that you can get the Slide 5 version, I think, still, maybe, but it was harder to find for a while. And then Walking Dead is the only one in the U.S. that you could get for a while. And I'm like, this is just my favorite game. It, the, you can't play it with your family and kids now because of this awful zombie art that's on it, you know? But... I don't know. I just I wanted mass. That game has mass appeal, but it's packaged as a horror themed game, and that didn't really sit with me it's, very well. If you're gonna play this game, if you're gonna buy it, you you have to forget the thing. Just yeah. forget and just and just play the game. Yeah. So um yeah, that's otherwise fine. you're definitely disappointed in that one. Yeah. All right. So see, I mean that's that's something to think about, right? I mean, don't you as a designer? I mean, we got in we got into designing games or whatever. I should say you guys got into designing games because you loved all the games that you played, and so you. You have all these thoughts and ideas because of games, you know. You, just like music, you it's by osmosis you start using mechanics and things and whatever that you learn playing all these other games. And so there's usually one or two things out there that you go, oh, I would have done that a little bit different. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's if I would. Uh, one of my favorite games is Kalos. So I would have tried to find a way to have made that theme work a little bit more because the theme has pretty much nothing to do with the game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, oh, I got one. I got one. I got one. Okay. Have you uh, played Takinoko? Yes. Takinoko. So Takinoko, I, I love that game. So you're the gardener that's trying to keep the panda alive and grow certain things in the garden to make him happy and to please the emperor. Um, well, there's this there's this mechanic in it where you just draw from one of the piles. It's a scorecard, right? It's your hidden objective, and uh, and I felt like there wasn't choice in that. 
So, like, I love the game, I love the mechanics, I love the theme, and you, like, just take the top card, and that's what you have to work on now. So, um, and one of my favorite games is Ticket to Ride. So, um, when <laughs> when I was uh, I was thinking about Ticket to Ride, where you can you draw a certain amount of objectives, and then you have to keep at least one. So, that was the house rule that, that I added, was, like, you can draw uh, three cards or whatever, and you keep, you have to keep one, so I kind of stole from Ticket to Ride to add that little bit of variability to Takenoko because I thought it just needed that little bit of extra choice in that particular section. And that's and I'm messing with Antoine Bowser there, like one of the one of the greats of game design. And uh, it's it's a really great game. And and I've had other people say, oh, that you have choices, and that's not a you don't need to do that. That's a horrible variant. But like my my wife won't even play it now unless we use that variant because it just makes it uh, takes it a little bit to the next level for us. Awesome. All right. So, top five games of all time. Oh, top five games of all time. Okay, so, uh, oh, man. Ticket to Ride okay. is one of my one of my favorites of all time. Um, Six Nymphed. It's a great, great uh, card game. Uh, blind bidding and awesomeness. Uh, goodness. Now I wish that I could see my game shelf. <laughs> um, I, I love uh, trick-taking games. I'm going to say Haggis. Uh, the indie boards and cards put out is one of my favorite games. It's a it's a it's a climbing game, but uh, it works really good with two to three players. Um, man, uh, of all time, what do I play? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Crokinole. Like I love flicking games, dexterity games. I'm terrible at Crokinole, but it's awesome. And then my fifth one. I don't know, like, I, I haven't played this in a while, but I love I love the system, and I love the way it works. Um, uh, so maybe Pandemic would be would, is really high up there. Um, like, that level of game to me, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, meaningful choices, um, that's just a huge spot for me. Yeah. Ink and Gold is another one of my favorites by Alan Moon. Um, so that's six, I think, but that's, that's up there, too. That's all right. I haven't actually played Ink and Gold yet, but I am an Alan Moon fan. Oh yeah, it's, that was uh, Fiduti, Bruno Fiduti, and Alan Moon, and uh, it's a great blind bidding pressure luck game where you're where you go deeper or go home, and it's just, oh it's got some tight tense choices. So I played that a lot with uh, my my old youth group, and my cards have have been well worn because it's just a loved game by so many different groups. All right, that brings us to an hour. So again, folks, Fidelitas is on Kickstarter. Five days left. There's two more goals to unlock, so please go back and make that happen. Uh, looking to ship out in January, two to four players, roughly 20 to 30 minutes long, pretty deep game. What else you want to say about it before we sign off? Yeah, you know, another thing that, that I haven't made uh, too well known is that it has a solo variant in the, in the rules. So there is a way that you can uh, play the game as a solitaire player. It's a fun experience. It's kind of you're going for a high score. You're trying to see if you can complete all of the missions in the game. So there's a couple little tweaks in a couple of the cards. But it's a nice uh, nice way if, if you want to you know give it a go. If, you, if you're interested to try the game out, you, you, you pay five bucks for the pledge. You go to one of the updates and you can get the print and play. You can print it out and play it and then decide if you want to Buy it for a full copy where you get all the stretch goals and get the nice production copy delivered. So try it before you buy it. Just come see what we're all about. Um, I'd love to have you consider our project. And if you want to talk or have any questions, my name is on Twitter is at Jason Kotarski. So I'd love to, to interact with you. Awesome. All right, folks. If you are watching this on our Club Fantasy page for the interview, all of his links are there at the bottom. The links to the Kickstarters are there. A link to Board Game Geek for his other games is there. Um, you can find all of our links there as well, and we would appreciate your support, your votes, your follows, your likes, everything, because we work really hard to bring you great board gaming information and content. So, Jason, thank you so much for your time and making this happen on such short notice. Yeah, thank you for having me, David. It was uh, it was a pleasure. I appreciate you so much. All right. We, we hope you get you know all the success out of this that you can possibly want. Folks, five days left. Make sure you have a please share, and uh, don't be afraid. You know, I know some of you are funny about sharing stuff and spamming. Share the link. Um, uh, you know, it's how we get the word out about stuff like this. We we need the support, so share the link. Um, again, Jason, thank you. Uh, folks, you can find us at clubfantasy.com. Please, if there's anybody you want to interview, games you want reviewed, whatever, just shoot us a note on our contact page, and we'd love to make it happen for you. 
All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.